Hi, my name is Caitlin Palachek and I am with Cook County Health. Thanks for joining us. If you need help with an appointment or have a medical question, you can reach out to our health system at 312-864-0200. That's 312-864-0200. My guest tonight is Dr. Brian Humphrey, clinical psychiatrist, psychologist. How are you? Thank you I'm, for joining I'm, us. Thank you very much, Caitlin, for having me. I appreciate Great. it. So tonight we are going to talk about men's health. Numerous re researchers have recently stated that there is a silent crisis when it comes to men's health. Would you agree? I would say so for certain, yes. Um, depression is very serious. Mental health uh, can encompass any of a number overall of uh, difficulties, including depression, anxiety, uh, substance use, uh, etc. And so though those are broad categories that classify, uh, the different type of mental illness that may be uh, present, uh, there are more specifics that would kind of, you know, embody what those actual classifications would be. Okay, and what would you say is a percentage in suicide of men compared to women? It's a great question, Caitlin. Um, overall, women are 3.54, about 3.54 times more likely to um, commit suicide, but men are overall more likely to successfully complete a suicide. So okay. versus, whereas women may make more attempts, men are more use more lethal means and actually okay. succeed. And what factors would you believe that this is attributed to? Many factors could contribute to suicidality. Uh, depression is um, a very prominent and popular one because usually the person sometimes feels very hopeless or the emotional distress that comes from feeling sad right. can leave them feeling that this is the only uh, you know, recourse to take. Mm -hmm. uh, other factors can also include substance use or certain uh, illicit uh, substances that an individual may take. Um, certain health conditions, so kind of end-of-life concerns, uh, risk factors including um, gender and age, those type of variables can increase the uh, likelihood that an actual suicidal episode may actually occur. And do you think that there is a cause for a difference between men being able to successfully complete it versus women maybe stopping halfway through or however the situation ends up playing out? Well, again, so like women mainly make more attempts. So a lot of the attempts may not be as lethal. So okay. for example, overdosing, um, you know, self-mutilation or cutting uh, versus men are more likely to use the more lethal means. So uh, using firearms or hanging or more uh, significant uh, attempts. Uh, there's also a notion I would like to say of uh, this notion of passive suicidality as well. I think it's very important um, that we understand that there's a difference between the two. So just because a person is saying that they are experiencing kind of these thoughts of death doesn't mm -hmm. mean that they are always necessarily suicidal. It's what we kind of call suicidal ideation. And so suicidal ideation is usually the thoughts about suicide. In order for an individual to be uh, clinically considered a risk to themselves, which would result in or the need for a psychiatric hospitalization, uh, they would have to have an intent uh, mm -hmm. to do so, a plan, a means, and access to the means of, of doing so, but definitely uh, a, a willing and willful intention to cause an imminent harm to themselves. Um, passively, that can happen in a number of different ways. I've had some patients who, for example, have indicated that they would rather walk in front of an oncoming car, like they themselves would not feel very comfortable being able to do so. Or I've even had some instances where individuals were saying that they would never shoot themselves, but they would maybe try to get in a uh, firearm you know, situation with a police officer, for example. So in this indirect way of kind of still ex wanting to execute mm -hmm. you know, the end of their life, but not doing it directly the themselves, a more indirect approach. And do you think that this is more common in certain groups or ethnicities? Um, with suicide or mm -hmm. depression? So, so yes, well depression specifically um, and, and suicide, I would like to say that depression is uh, what I like to call, it's a human condition, so it, it, is, it does not discriminate, it's not discriminatory, so regardless of one's gender, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, age, religious affiliation, it can impact and affect um, anybody. Uh, statistics do show, the research does show, that the highest rate of suicidal, um, you know, or, or instances of suicidality uh, occur with middle-aged Caucasian men. Um, but again, there are a number of risk factors that could move that depending on the circumstance of the situation. So if the person is, um, you know, 
feel, you know, recently received a chronic disease or a chronic illness. Um, they have a history, a family history of depression and or suicide attempts. They themselves have a previous uh, history of suicide attempts. Those are all factors that mm -hmm. could influence the likelihood that they may actually have a subsequent one or even an initial one. History of loved ones and or friends that have committed suicide, things like that. Um, really, in adolescence and, and, and in youth, we are seeing a spike in suicidal gestures and ideation or expressed suicidal thoughts and ideation. Um, with cyberbullying. So there are a number of factors that could influence it and it's, it's hard to really say that it's, it's consistently uh, one versus the other, but the highest incidence of that is uh, the Caucasian male who is middle-aged. Thanks. And speaking of factors, can you talk about substance use as it relates to mental health, depression, suicide? Sure. So substance use uh, overall um, is, is over, and when we say substance use, I'm specifically now talking about illicit substances, mm -hmm. so we're talking more of like the illegal abuse, abuse yeah. correct. Um, th so what we see is that it can actually exacerbate some of the symptoms of those kind of conditions that you talked about. So um, as we know, for example, consuming alcohol may compromise one's judgment or their ability to be able to think fluently and coherently, and so therefore the individual may be more impulsive and more maybe predisposed to do something and execute a thought that may have already been there. Um, though there are many cases of depression as well that, um, or cases of uh, substance use with alcohol where the individual has consumed so much alcohol that um, they have had just a number of deleterious effects in their life, uh, including loss of employment, loss of job, loss of family, loss of, you know, esteem, or, and sometimes the sense of self-worth, uh, guilt, and things of that nature that really eat the person up. Mm -hmm. And then that can actually give way to a depressive episode. Mm -hmm. um, so you're saying it starts with another factor and then the substance abuse just heightens that type of feeling? Yeah, so that's a great question to distinguish. So I'm saying both. I'm, a, 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 an actual substance can actually induce an, or predispose a person to experience the depression or the suicidality, but also the substance itself can actually cause the person to experience that as well. What we see is that usually a lot of individuals, there is a high comorbidity comor between substance use and some of these mental health disorders that you mentioned, such as depression. And um, what, we, what we see is that individuals oftentimes will use alcohol as a very maladaptive or unhealthy mm -hmm. way of coping with uh, depression. Okay. So it is a way to kind of distract or to distance or not having to deal with the realities of whatever the stressor or the circumstance that may be leading to the depression is. But with depression, it doesn't always have to always be an identifiable cause. It could be a, a combination of many different factors. Um, it could be something that has just kind of slowly become exacerbated over time. Um, and there are some cases where it's just, you know, there are symptoms, but it's not an actual diagnosable major depressive disorder per mm -hmm. se. So, for example, if an individual is um, diagnosed with a condition where the, um, the thyroid is um, the hypothyroidism, mm -hmm. that can give symptoms of the depression, but it's not necessarily a, depress a major depressive disorder as defined by the uh, DSM-5, the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, 5th edition, which is the current edition that we're in now. So. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about anxiety disorders and what that looks like in sure. men? Sure. So anxiety in men um, can manifest in a number of ways. Anxiety, by definition, is it is a fear. Um, that fear response can be caused or manifest in any of a number of different uh, anxiety disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder, where, for example, an individual may encounter or be exposed to a traumatic situation that really leaves them feeling a, a constellation of symptoms, including uh, this hyper-awareness sense of their surroundings, also known as hypervigilance. Uh, it can leave them very distrustful of others. Uh, it can leave them with a constant sense of dread and unease, a nervousness, mm -hmm. uh, irritability. These are some common symptoms of anxiety in general. Um, and speaking of general, there is a condition called generalized anxiety disorder. And in generalized anxiety disorder, um, there are, there's not an identifiable always cause to produce those symptoms, but they nonetheless experience, are experienced by the person. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, this is an individual who may worry a lot, they may have racing thoughts, they may be, uh, you know, they may perseverate over a particular, you know, thought or concern. 
Um, sometimes there is a, lo a loss of appetite or even a sleep disturbance. They can't fall asleep because they're worrying or they're, you know, just, you know, their mind is racing, feeling very anxious. And so men typically, for the most part, with any mental health dis disorder, um, they, they manifest their symptoms somatically. So a lot of times it's the physical expression that you actually see coming through. I usually don't get many men coming in saying, hey, you know, Dr. Humphrey, I'm feeling, you know, I'm having major depressive disorder or I'm having an anxiety disorder. They may have an anxiety attack um, or a panic attack, mm -hmm. but the individual will oftentimes come and say, you know, I'm just, I'm always worrying. I'm always on edge. I'm always, you know, I'm just tired of just always kind of thinking about the same thing, just ruminating over the same thing over and over. And so it is those symptoms that kind of lets us know that maybe it's anxiety. Um, versus actually calling it anxiety, like calling it post-traumatic stress disorder. They may say, I experienced a traumatic situation, and it's very um, difficult to get over, and I think about it all the time, I'm having nightmares about this, and I just can't seem to, to shake it. We know that those symptoms that they are describing are anxiety symptoms that are probably best, in that instance, categorized as post-traumatic stress disorder. And did you say that these symptoms can manifest themselves into physical symptoms? Mm -hmm. For example, somebody can have a lot of stomach aches, yes. but really it's anxiety or headaches and... You got it. Yeah, I think that one of, a very popular way that anxiety manifests itself is gastrointestinally. So a lot of the times the individual will have an, 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 an uneasy stomach, um, it may impact uh, respiration, so the way that they breathe, they may find that they are uh, feeling labored breathing or shallow breath or like sensations of the chest. Um, those are part of a constellation of symptoms that are um, known as uh, panic attacks or anxiety attacks. Uh, main differentiator between the two being that the anxiety attacks are more unprovoked and unknown what causes those versus the panic attacks usually sometimes can have an identifiable trigger that actually causes that physiological arousal. So people sometimes say they have headaches um, because mm -hmm. again they're just kind of worrying and so it adds these kind the of pressure. tension, the pressure, headaches, exactly. Um, and so men when they present in the, in, 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 in the clinic they will oftentimes report these physical symptoms and manifestations of anxiety. Absolutely. Yeah. So, how likely are men to utilize mental health services? Um, sad to say, across the board, men overall do not access many health services uh, for a number of reasons. Um, usually when I see men come in, they ultimately come in with a loved one or a significant other, and it's usually at a place where it is an intervention versus a, a prevention. Mm -hmm. So I believe in prevention, and I, and I encourage everybody to get routine and regular mental health checkups just to ensure that um, overall there are no you know, latent or unknown mental health distress that may be going on. A professional will be able to kind of help you to identify lifestyle concerns that, are, that may be at risk or, you know, kind of seeing the proverbial train about to derail before it actually happens. Mm -hmm. So back to your question, Caitlin, um, you know, a lot of times men are reluctant to come in for a number of reasons, whether it's, um, you know, myths and stigma about what's kind of going on, mental health in general. I can't tell you how many times I get per day somebody coming in saying, you're not going to lock me up, are you? You're not going to put me in restraints and tie me upside down and inject me with shots. You know, a lot of things that have just, unfortunately, some some, you know, we, we, can, we can make light of it now. And unfortunately, as the history of psychology has evolved, some of these practices uh, are not, were not totally unheard of, but they're not the way that we do things now. And it's certainly not the way that it's always advertised on television. And so um, men usually will be reluctant to come in because they feel that it's going to be the extreme, that they're going to be taken away from their families, that they're going to be placed in a, that I won't have a sense of control. They will not be able to, you know, have their rights will be taken from them, et cetera. Um, but, Men overall do not really access physical health care or mental health care um, as, much as, as much as women, and that is a huge issue because a lot of these mental health issues could be predicted prior to the actual serious manifestation of them, mm -hmm. um, and therefore prevented or interventions provided um, sooner, or they could overall be ameliorated entirely um, before it is, you know, a significant and chronic right. issue. So. What kind of advice would you give to someone that's looking for a therapist? What kind of person should you look for? Are there like certain types? Like should a man see a male therapist? Sure. Should, like does it matter? So there are a number of factors. That, um, I, I, it, it's hard to specifically say that there is a set criteria that kind of defines 
you know, like a protocol of how to go about selecting mm -hmm. one. There are some instances where um, there may be an opportunity for men who might have various relational difficulties with women. A therapist, a female therapist um, who identifies as female, may be able to uh, work through some of that transferential things right. that may come and actually the enactment that actually mm -hmm. may occur in the therapeutic session and really work through some of the difficulties that the individual is experiencing. Um, um, my biggest thing is uh, a number of ways that you can access mental health services. One, you can definitely use the use on the internet. So go online. You can look. There's a lot of databases on there that indicate the individual's um, credentials. You want to know what their credentials are. Everybody is not licensed. Licensed meaning that they have been that they've demonstrated competency to be able to perform a particular, um, you know, form of therapy. So you can look, um, you know, there's just a number, I don't want to say any in particular, but if you do a quick Google search, you can find lots of individuals' websites uh, that kind of list the individual's uh, information. Um, they have, you know, now all kinds of different variables that an individual who feels comfortable with. So they may want an individual with a particular um, spiritual affiliation and or uh, identification uh, or a particular gender, or they may be a specific um, issue that the individual is experiencing where they may, they may elect to identify with somebody who might be having more experience with that particular situation or experience. Um, and so it's really hard to just say that there's a general way of doing it, but I would say the internet is the best bet. The easiest way that I always say is also talking to your doctor. So your medical doctor can also give you a referral mm -hmm. to most um, cases, as the case with the Cook County Health, um, many of the providers can then give you a referral directly there. In fact, mo all the ambulatory clinics have uh, mental health specialists there um, where they can actually see a provider who may see the medical doctor and then be referred to a mental health specialist right then and there just to see if there is a need, if there, what will be the next steps, if traditional therapy is needed, they could really serve as like that gateway to being able to access additional support and additional resources. Look at your insurance card. If you have insurance, you can also call the number on the back and they can also give you based on the radius of the zip code that you give them, uh, individuals who might, you know, fit within your predefined parameters that you're mm -hmm. looking for. What do you do if you don't have to? insurance. Can you still access mental health services? You absolutely can. There's a number of ways you can do it, and especially in this digital age, there's a lot of different uh, technological ways to be able to do so as well. In the case of significant issues um, where we're in a crisis, such as suicidality, for example, I tell the person all the time, don't hesitate, immediately go to the emergency room. Call 911, go to the emergency room, um, have someone take you. Um, don't worry about the insurance because in that moment, it is about stabilization because right. there may not be a substance subsequent, you know, uh, life, you know, should you do something um, because of the moment or the, uh, the, the, the circumstance or the situation that the person is in, um, may make decisions because they feel that they cannot see other alternatives. Other um, ways of being able to do, do so other than just walking into the hospital is also, um, you know, through, we offer at Cook County, county care, so if they, if they do meet certain criteria, then individuals who are uninsured will be able to utilize that as a form of insurance as well. The employer might be able to do so. There are many clinics that do things um, that, that have a uh, rolling fee a scale, and they may not charge anything at all, but there is help. I don't ever want anybody to feel that that is a barrier to accessing mental health. Sometimes it's just about um, knowing what is available and what are the resources out there. So case managers, social workers, clinical psychologists, medical doctors, all of these professionals can help the individual find the care and the help they need. And what else can men do to cope? Uh, that's a good question. So um, there are a number of things that men can do to cope. What they should not do is use substances because substances is unfortunately a very common and a very popular way that um, men deal with a lot of the distress or st stress or mental illness that they may have. And as we've just previously talked about, the substances can actually exacerbate that. So healthier alternatives, um, I often will say, uh, is uh, identifying a hobby. So being able to have something that an individual can make regular investments in that can distract them from the particular circumstance and or situation that's going on. Again, this is determinant on what the mental health diagnosis or condition is. Absolutely. Or the physical health condition. Because, for example, coping might be attending a group therapy session with other individuals, other men, who might be sharing any particular experience. Survivors of, for example, childhood sexual trauma. Uh, one way to cope with that may be to hear other people's experiences and how they overcame those experiences and share what their journey has been and kind of having this mutual support. 
Physical exercise is perhaps one of the most big, the, the largest mm -hmm. uh, coping skill that I usually equip men with. Is it with. because of endorphins? Yes, it definitely has a lot to do with physiological re regulation um, and stabilization of um, you know the, physio the biophysiology of, of, of humans, whether man or female doesn't matter. Um, but it also serves as an outlet, so it allows you to be able to not focus necessarily. It's kind of like a meditative exercise right. where you're able to kind of zone out and kind of focus on either the pain from actually working or challenging yourself to kind of overcome things. Um, and it's an opportunity to kind of disconnect in that moment from the actual source of the stressor. So um, another big one is uh, breathing. So yoga is really big. Stretching, exercising is a way to kind of, you know, uh, regulate better oxygen, diaphragmatic breathing, guided imagery. These are uh, techniques that um, can be employed to help to alleviate stress mm -hmm. or to help to just cope with whatever is going on. And these, all these recommendations I'm giving, you know, uh, assuming that there's no physical issue or anything that's going on, can help with a breadth of different disorders overall. So exercise can help with depression, it can help with anxiety, it can help with, you know, what we formerly called our access to a personality disorders, for example. Mm -hmm. And what do you think we as a society can do to help reduce the stigma? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, there are many things I think that we can do. Uh, the first is, I think, to create an actual um, dialogue. I think that having an active dialogue and dismantling some of the myths about uh, mental health is absolutely important. This needs to take place during childhood. Um, men specifically oftentimes are unfortunately subjected to a phenomenon that we call toxic masculinity, which are these really unhealthy kind of idealized or value-based um, beliefs about what constitutes a man. And so um, men are supposed to be strong. Men don't cry. Mm -hmm. Men don't feel pain. Men don't get depressed. Men don't get anxious. Men are always in control. And if an individual is experiencing one of those things, then inevitably they begin to feel less than the mm -hmm. standard. And so being able to normalize this as a human condition, a human experience, uh, opens it up so that it's not right. just linked to one particular type. Everybody, depending on the circumstance, can unfortunately uh, experience any of these conditions. And and we know that uh, talking about it and having a dialogue and a discourse about it will really help to provide and put out there the correct information, accurate data, accurate, you know, resetting the beliefs, but accurate information about this is normative and this is okay. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. It does. It does. It does. It does. <laughs> so, so if you see a change in your friend or loved one's yeah. motor behavior, mm -hmm. what kind of advice could you give people? So lots of things. Uh, you can... Um, you know, definitely dialogue with the individual about what is con it is causing what what you have ob what you are observing as the actual uh, change. Mm -hmm. The individual may not be aware of it themselves. It could be a bad day. It could be something that is more long standing. So getting clarification on that, um, a loved one can actually help the, the individual make an appointment and accompany them to the appointment. Um, or direct them to a professional who might be able to better assess and to be able to see, uh, you know, the changes. I think the most important thing that an individual could do is be supportive, uh, be open to different approaches that may work, but to, to kind of appreciate the person where they are mm -hmm. um, without kind of condemning them or judging them or really ostracizing them or making them seem like something is wrong, taking more of a more positive approach such as, you know, I want to I help you, Let's, I want to support you. Let's, Work with this together, you know. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yes. Anything else you want to add? Um, you know, if anything, you know, my, you know, I'm, I am a, a clinical psychologist at Cook County Health and Hospital Systems, uh, now Cook County Health, and I always just, you know, let everybody know that mental health uh, is is serious. It's very real. Do not feel embarrassed or do not feel shy uh, or anything of that nature because you might be experiencing symptoms. And just because you're experiencing symptoms does not mean that it's a classifiable mental health disorder as well. So I just encourage everybody that when you are seeing your medical providers, get regular checkups um, and get just as well as your physical health is important, your mental health is important as well. So getting assessed just the lifestyle changes to see if there is anything that could be preventative in nature and we can therefore give interventions more, more immediate versus kind of intervention. But if we do need to do something in terms of intervention, we want you to access the available resources and not unfortunately fall short of the barriers that may prevent you or you think that may be preventing you from being able to access those.
Great. Well, this has been so informative. I've learned a lot, and I hope that everyone else watching this today has learned a lot. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. So I cannot wait me. to have you back. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.